broadly, I think I say that I am not in the capacity market camp, but I am in the energy plus something camp. And so what I mean by that is some form of mandatory contracting around full strength spot prices. So the great success of the Australia and the Texas model is the is the full strength spot prices, which mm. which does provide at least in real time very good incentives for demand response for the performance of generators and provides a sound basis for evaluating performance. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Hugo Batten, Managing Director of Aurora in Australia and California. We're very much looking forward to today's discussion. We have Professor Jacob Mays in today. He's the Assistant Professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University. He's also studied at Harvard, Wisconsin-Madison, and Northwestern. He's also been a management consultant and worked at FERC. And he writes some of the best energy papers in markets I operate in across a very diverse range of topics. Jacob, welcome to Energy Unplugged. We're delighted you can join us. Uh, Well, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. We're also joined today by Oliver Kerr, our head of US, who is going to interview Jacob with me. Really happy to be here. So let's kick it off with a little inside baseball question and the role of energy modeling. Jacob, you do obviously a lot of sophisticated energy market modeling in your academic work. What do you think is the right role for energy market modeling, particularly in debates around optimal market design? And and I often use as an example modeling of capacity markets where simplistic assumptions are made about reducing costs of capital which, which makes things look better. But in some ways, kind of equilibrium outcomes are unhelpful and not the way things tend to eventuate. Do, do we use energy market models in the right way, particularly as we're thinking about setting up the rules of the game? Uh, well, it's a, it's a kind of a big question, I think. So there's, there's clearly a, a use for market models by market participants within the market. Uh, but then the, the, the higher level question about debates about market design is, is I think, trickier. But it, the usefulness kind of stems from the fact that power markets are not bottom-up, emergent, self-organizing things, but they really are top-down, uh, you know, heavily regulated, heavily designed systems. And so uh, it, it re- requires rather intense effort to try to figure out, are the power markets delivering the kind of results that we want them to give from a regulatory standpoint? So uh, w- whether that's monitoring from exercise of market power or uh, you know, w- assessing whether the system is going to meet its reliability targets or something like that, we want to we kind of have a check on, is the market actually delivering uh, what we want it to achieve? Uh, one thing I want to distinguish here is that there's, there could be another use of modeling to say, is it going to achieve things outside the 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 explicit mandate of the market design. So is it going to uh, uh, press toward decarbonization fast enough, for example, or is it going to support a particular technology that we uh, have an interest in supporting? But that's kind of a a separate uh, type of topic. So so I think in a lot of my work, uh, the the question is, um, is the market design succeeding on its own terms in terms of delivering reliability at least cost uh, so, so the the usefulness of modeling is there's all sorts of ways that we might intervene to introduce a new ancillary service product to refine refine the existing ones to uh, redesign or tweak the capacity markets, et cetera. And we have to figure out how are we going to devote our stakeholder and our regulatory efforts to get the most bang for the buck and and uh, evolve the market design, so to speak. And uh, and modeling can help inform. Uh, where we decide to to direct our efforts, and and just to follow on from that, you know, modeling clearly does play a role in some pretty important policy debates. Uh, you know, we all know that you know it's garbage in, garbage out. But I think it can be difficult sometimes for stakeholders or policymakers to sniff out that garbage. You know, especially if it's hidden in some you know seemingly innocuous assumptions around cost of capital or something like that. So I, I mean, you spend a lot of time doing what I call you know public outreach and awareness raising. 
you know, how important is modeling literacy for policymakers and, and stakeholders in the energy industry more broadly? Uh, well, I I, uh, I think it is important, and what I what I appreciate the most about uh, modeling and being mathematically precise thing about things is that you know there's the, you have to be really clear about this is the assumption that we're making and 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 this is why it's important and, and how it affects the the economic conclusion or the uh, the the policy conclusion that that you're. Uh, driving toward. So I think if the, the clearer you can be about here's the assumption and here's the, the implication, uh, I think the better, because uh, obviously we don't expect uh, everybody involved in the stakeholder meetings to to be able to uh, do the optimization modeling or the equilibrium modeling on their own. We, we want to, uh, but we at the same time want to get people on the same page of, of, of why it's, it's worth supporting this or that, uh, that uh, implementation decision. Yeah, for sure. So that they can be intelligent consumers of the, the outputs from modeling exercises. Moving from market modeling to market design, and um, you've commented on, on this topic in a, a number of different forums. The two of the markets that Olive and I cover, Australia and Texas, are in the midst of market design debates. And I think somewhat simplistically, at least in Australia, collapsing on capacity market, yes, no. Um, it would be good to give the audience who's kind of not familiar with your broad views on wholesale energy versus capacity market and wholesale debate, kind of where you sit on that. And what do you see as the global trends? Like it does feel like capacity markets are kind of weaning in inverted commas and, and penetrating markets that were previously pretty dedicated to wholesale only structures or wholesale plus strategic reserves. Is that your sense or, or not Oliver and I just focusing too much on Australia and, and Texas potentially? No, I think that's accurate. And, and I think, you know, very justifiably, if you look at what happened in Texas last year and what's happening in Australia at the moment, there's, there's a lot less confidence that an energy only model is, is viable. Mm. Um, and I, and I think that's, uh, an accurate diagnosis in a sense that um, it's, it's not, it's in Texas, it clearly didn't deliver the reliability, the resource adequacy that, uh, that was expected of it. And, uh, and Australia, the, I, I don't think there have been the same reliability issues, but, but certainly the price outcomes haven't been, uh, haven't been good. And there's the need to suspend the market and have all of these out of market interventions and, and uh, uh, things that are not in the textbook, so to speak about energy only markets. So, uh, so broadly, I think I I say that I am in not in the capacity market plan, but I uh, uh, camp, but I am in the uh, energy plus something camp. And so, what I mean by that is some form of mandatory contracting around full strength spot prices. So the 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 great success of the Australia and the Texas model is the is the full strength spot prices, which mm. which does provide at least. Uh, in, in real time, very good incentives for demand response for the performance of generators um, and, and provides a sound basis uh, for, for evaluating performance. Uh, where the ma mandatory contracts come in is we want to have some security from, uh, uh, from the, the load side that we've procured enough in advance, and we want to have some uh, way of evaluating generators or holding them their feet to the fire, so to speak, in terms of they got to deliver on the on the contractual obligations, and um, and so if you have full strength uh, uh, spot prices and you have a, a contract around those spot prices, you have a natural way of assessing uh, whether a generator has performed and who to punish financially if if they don't perform. Um, so I think that that's, uh, uh, that's a broad uh, way of looking at it uh, that's a little bit broader than just a capacity market mm -hmm. where ca capacity market markets uh, financially work kind of like an option with a high strike price. So what you're trading is you, you have this upfront premium and then you never pay any high spot prices. Uh, but that's just you know, one form of contract design mm -hmm. uh, among, the, of, among the whole uh, smorgasbord that, that arise in, in real world commercial arrangements. Uh, there's no real reason to privilege that one uh, above, uh, above the others. And there's some reasons to think that, um, that it's, it's actually not as, as good a contract form for, 
uh, for all technologies, uh, uh, or and it's certainly there's, there's no real reason to think that one contractual form would be the best for all technologies. Uh, the other aspect of it, of course, is that in most of the areas of the capacity markets, they've also degraded the spot prices. So they no longer have full strength spot prices. And then you get into all sorts of debates about, okay, how are we going to val- evaluate and penalize non-performance? And that's a very tricky uh, tricky and political thing to do. So uh, so just, just to kind of uh, summarize, that's kind of what's, what's led me to think we, we need to have the full strength spot prices, but we need. We also need to have the the protection and the mandatory contracting around those. And just to sharpen that off a little bit with an example. So, I mean, one of the possible outcomes from the market reform process in Texas right now is that we end up with something like, um, you know, a load serving entity obligation, um, you know, similar to the the Kaisto RA market concept. What do you think are the advantages of a, a sort of decentralized? load serving entity obligation like that versus a centrally run and procured capacity part and payment with a single clearing price? Uh, it's a it's a good question. And I think I'm I'm open to arguments on both sides. The uh, the the nice thing about the uh, the decentralized way is that you you get, do give a little bit more flexibility to to market participants to to land on something that's going to work for them. Uh, the downside is that there's a danger of uh, consolidation in the market. So uh, it's it's possible that that leads to more concentration. Um, the other uh, downside, I think, is that especially what we've seen um, in in Europe, but also in Texas and Australia, is that the uh, the financial risks in that. Are involved in uh, in in energy only markets are gigantic. There's pretty significant risk of bankruptcy. There's counterparty credit risk. There's uh, there's there's margin calls and liquidity issues. And so if you do things in a centralized manner and run it through the ISO, uh, there there's a there might be a little bit more capability to just uh, push that under the rug and recognize. Okay, we know if we can evaluate that they have physical backing for their contracts, we're going to trust that they'll. Uh, be able to meet their obligations, and we don't have to worry as much about uh, the the financial cash flow uh, type considerations. So, uh, so all that's uh, a way of saying I, I haven't really firmly decided on on centralized versus decentralized, but um, I maybe lean centralized at, at today. So we'll 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 see if I if I hold to that by the time this airs, but. <laughs> <laughs> And Jacob, this may be slightly beyond your purview, but one of the questions I come back to in these debates is I think they sometimes are simplistic both ways, like capacity markets are good or terrible. And I think there's often insufficient focus, at least in the academic literature, on the quality of implementation of policy. So having gone to Australia, I think the EMR reforms in the UK we're actually in some ways, you know, a very impressive achievement, carbon prices, capacity market, the Climate Change Commission, a whole pile of integrated policies that really did overhaul the market in a holistic and I think fairly well thought through way. Australia, for a variety of reasons, politics being the primary one, hasn't done that. And so we've got this wholesale only market structure, but where we've seen quite a lot of ad hoc government intervention, like government building random stuff when security of supply happens, which, you know, distorts the market, et cetera, et cetera. How do you think through quality of implementation? Is that something you don't really touch on in in your work? It's not something that I've written about. And, uh, and, you know, being a more of a mathematician than a political scientist or economist, I think it's, it's a, it's maybe further outside my, uh, uh, purview, but it's obviously incredibly important for for how well the market functions, and uh, uh, so I, I I think that you know having a consistent design that's gonna uh, be something that's in place ten years from now is is something that uh, provides some some measure of certainty to to investors mm-hmm. and the other market participants and. Uh, gonna is gonna help a lot rather than you know intervention after intervention every every uh, every time the FERC commission changes or every time the the presidential administration changes or uh, you know analogs in in Europe and uh, and Australia and elsewhere. 
Mm. I'm curious that a lot of the discussion right now in in multiple markets that we look at seems focused on, you know, a single metric, something like reserve margins. I'm con- I'm sort of curious to what extent you think that's a useful concept uh, versus, you know, there is a view that it's it's not just reserve margin that we need. It's you know, it's broader system flexibility. So h- how should we think about that more broadly? Oh, I, I think that reserve margin doesn't mean that much, and. Uh, we we definitely saw it in Texas where, you know, nominally you might have a 10% or a 12% reserve margin or something, but if nothing works, then, then that doesn't do you any good. Uh, so the if we're going to boil it down to one number, the one I like is expected unserved energy, which is is the, uh, the form that it takes in Australia where you have yeah. a, a reliability obligation and it's 0.002% of total energy, or maybe I missed a zero, but... Uh, in any case, it's a coherent metric where uh, it's in terms of the energy served uh, rather than uh, a, a reserve margin, which, you know, it, there's a lot of assumptions baked into there about whether resources are going to be able to perform, whether the wind is going to be uh, available, uh, whether the sun is going to be available, et cetera. Um, and, and so we've kind of increasingly seen that reserve margin does not mean what we think it ought to mean. So... Uh, I think beyond expected unserved energy, clearly there's there's interest in uh, how or what the distribution of the, that unserved energy looks like. So it clearly matters if you lose a little bit uh, every once in a while versus a whole lot all at once. Uh, that's going to be uh, different in terms of uh, the the uh, effect on people and uh, uh, and the effect on. Uh, the 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 political response to to the market design, so uh, uh, so it, it's not going to capture everything, but expected unserved energy is clearly better than than reserve margin. I think to turn a little bit towards kind of what's happening right now, we've obviously touched on this, particularly the the energy crisis in Australia. If you had to pick kind of two or three long run impacts of the current price and I think security of supply issues in the EU and Australia, what do you think they might be? Is it kind of just more government intervention on a rolling basis? Will it result in a faster transition and a a move away from volatile uh, commodities? What do you see is, you know, when when we look back in 10 years time and write the story of this energy crisis, what's going to be the things that changed? Uh, Well, uh, you know, predicting the future is obviously hard, but uh, uh, the uh, I think the you know one thing that you uh, should expect just seeing uh, gas prices are way higher than than they were a couple of years ago, um, way higher than probably a lot of people were anticipating in as being within the distribution of possible uh, gas prices even. And, uh, and and so just based on that, you should expect some movement away from gas. And and uh, the, the clear winner there is renewables. Uh, the, uh, at the same time, there's obviously concerns about reliability that, that, uh, that renewables might not fully solve. And so, uh, so there might be more interested in nuclear or, uh, or, hydrogen or, or some other technology that's that that people are going to want to put more money into their governments I should specify are going to want to put more money into uh, to ensuring security of supply I think the uh, from a market design standpoint uh, it's clear that there's a lot more appetite for long-term hedges mm. and and making those mandatory than there uh, than there was two years ago um, so when you see, uh, the, I, I guess now the former prime minister of the UK is saying we need to decouple prices from marginal costs, you know, commenting on details of market design. That's, uh, that's kind of a bad sign for the, for the, the stability <laughs> of that market design. And, um, and so the, the most obvious way from a, from a market design standpoint to decouple, uh, electricity prices from the price of natural gas and to move away from marginal cost in terms of what shows up on uh, customer bills is, is, is long-term contracts. And, uh, and so having more of those, whether they're, uh, whether they're orchestrated by the government or whether they're, they're uh, orchestrated by uh, load serving entities or, or people in the market, 
I think uh, seems like a likely outcome of this, at least in the in the near term. Moving now towards um, the another piece, uh, which I think is very front and center, at least in the U.S. context, which is uh, network and transmission. Um, you know, whether it's for reliability concerns or or it's just enabling the greater penetration of renewables more broadly. I think you know building new transmission, whether it's into market or intra market, is is going to be crucial. Um, it's also really hard to do for, for a variety of factors. Um, you know, and in most jurisdictions, typically what will happen is you'll do a, you know, a fairly simplistic you know, cost-benefit social welfare analysis to decide whether a new line gets built. What are we missing? So putting politics and you know, social license to operate to one side, what are we missing from a technical perspective in, in those sorts of analyses um, if we're to see more, more transmission getting built and that investment case being more attractive? Yeah, so so I think uh, you're right that uh, you know the the technical aspect is probably not the the major uh, roadblock to expanding uh, expanding transmission, uh, but uh, certainly from a modeling standpoint, uh, as a researcher, there's there's a lot that can be done to improve our uh, our understanding of where that's useful and and how useful it is and how much we should be willing to pay for it. Uh, one is in uh, characterizing uncertainty. So it's clear that weather extremes uh, mm. are are difficult to model and probably more difficult because of the non-stationarity with, with climate change. And so understanding what's the what's the type of weather extremes that we can see and feeding that into planning models for how much transmission do we need to support uh, exchanges between areas that are affected by extreme uh, weather is uh is i think an, an area for for improvement uh and then from a modeling standpoint let's say we've characterized that uncertainty we need models that are uh for decision making under uncertainty that can uh that can be uh informative in making decisions that are robust to the, the range of scenarios we've we've modeled uh there's a couple other uh kind of uh modeling tasks or modeling challenges that that show up, I think, a lot. One is uh, that uh, whenever you build a, a, a transmission expansion, you need to have a view on what's the response of that, uh, what's the mm. response of investors going to be in generation, and uh, and so having a good view of you know what's what's going to be the likely outcome in terms of the long run equilibrium uh, means you need to incorporate that that uh, that uh, that second level of what's going to be the, the response among market participants. And that's somewhat challenging from a, a, a modeling standpoint. Uh, and then the even more challenging uh, thing from a modeling standpoint is incorporating the, uh, the, the benefit of transmission expansion in terms of mitigating market power, where uh, one of the things that transmission does is it, it makes the market bigger and, and therefore less concentrated and, and then therefore uh, suppliers are less a bit able to to exercise market power, and that's uh, something that's really difficult to quantify in uh, in an optimization modeling context. Uh, so it's tricky to to evaluate, you know, what's going to be the benefit of that from from a, a social standpoint. Yeah, J Jacob, completely agree on both of those points, and we're going to lose half the audience here because this is getting real technical. But I do think better integration of capacity expansion price models and network and power flow models is really important here. And at least in every jurisdiction I've been in, the modeling I've seen is pretty static. So they don't capture those feedback loops that you described that if you do build a whopping new transmission line, you actually unlock quite a lot of new capacity and there's market responses to that and that has real benefit. So I, I completely agree with you there. Um, uh, you know, the uh, a modeler is always going to say the answer is more modeling. Um, but I, I genuinely think there are some technical improvements there that that could make these cases far more compelling. It's mm -hmm. then about communicating it to regulators. I think the other topic, and we've done quite a lot of modeling in this in Australia because it's such a big, long, fragile grid, but the concept of virtual transmission, so particularly building batteries so you don't have to run assets um, at N minus one constraints, um, is I think huge, but again, you need good models that integrate dispatch and flow to do that well. And so I think that's why that business case hasn't taken off in, in more places. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And there's just not, uh, there's, there's not a lot of detail in terms of what, what can you do operationally to get around a transmission issue uh, in, in terms of, you know, if you have storage available or if you have uh, other, other other resources that are available that you can dispatch the system around, uh, it's difficult to incorporate that in a transmission expansion model. Uh, a lot of the transmission studies that get done, especially for purposes of, of, uh, of interconnection, just kind of assume here's our power flow case or here's our set of power flow cases without any sort of economic dispatch or uh, you know, uh, logic around, is this actually going to be how the system is operated? Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, clearly going to be inefficient and, and, uh, going to lead to some recommendations that, that don't really make any economic sense. And, and it's of course, all the more challenging now, given the sheer number of projects looking to interconnect to the system Absolutely. And, and the sort of modeling requirements that that would imply, um, j just on that, a sort of related point to so FERC recently, uh, released a transmission proposal that's, you know, at least intended to make things a little bit easier to build out transmission, things like prioritizing local projects over regional ones. To what extent do you think that that could help ease some of these challenges, at least in the U.S. context? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, certainly I am hopeful that we can make some progress on it. That it, it's uh, There's been, I think, some progress in terms of, uh, you know, in the, in the Midwest, with integration or coordination between MISO and SPP. Um, and, and it's very clear that because of the wind potential there, that uh, that having a, a more forward-looking uh, and, and coordinated effort to expand transmission would be beneficial there. Um, at the same time, you know, we're, we're not kind of getting rid of the fundamental economic challenges, which is you have these, you know, regulated monopolies that are transmission owners that have their their service territories that they want to protect, and you have um, some amount of uh, parochialism or uh, whatever you want to call it to uh, to avoid uh, interconnecting. And then, you know, whenever you have a, a big uh, network expansion, you have to decide who's going to pay for it, and and uh, there's there's going to be disagreements about. Uh, who's going to be the likely beneficiaries of, of of any expansion, and who therefore should should bear the cost? Uh, so I, I don't think it's it's going to be a complete answer, but hopefully it does kind of push the needle on, on making some of these projects uh, more viable. To narrow it down a little bit to California, um, many observers, including yourself, I think, have said. You know quite rightly that that California in some ways started the liberalization journey but but never fully got there. So is this slightly unique blend of competitions that part of the value chain, but also you know fairly direct regulation and intervention, um, you know particularly through the integrated resource plan and and then the RA markets. Do, do you see it evolving again over the long term, or do you think we've kind of reached an equilibrium where we are in California? And it will it will stay relatively unchanged at least out to, to 2030 or, or 2035, uh, uh, where some of these decarbonisation goals, at least in theory, have to be hit. Well, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, I, I, I guess I would say that you know certainly when a couple summers ago they had the reliability issues and and. And certainly there was there was a mandate to say, okay, well, we, we need to be thinking about resource adequacy to mm. in in a different way. Uh if to the extent that the market design was 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 part of what contributed to uh to those shortfalls. Um so I yeah, I, I think that this is another one that's a little bit outside my uh purview, uh, because I haven't been involved in the in the California debates uh, specifically. Uh, I, I suspect that, uh, California is not going to go to the way of embracing markets and, and they will continue to, to find ways to, to try to drive, uh, drive the market outcomes toward what they, what they want to see in the resource mix. Um, mm. uh, and, and whether they've already landed on the set of tools that will accomplish that, or they'll keep on introducing new ones is, uh, I, I suspect they'll, they'll find new New ones to, <laughs> to <laughs> new new ideas to to keep to keep driving the outcomes that they want to they want to see at the uh, CPUC and, and the 
uh, in the government. Maybe just in the interest of time, then we, we should pivot a little bit to your career. Um, so as I said, you know, your, your papers are always excellent and, and I think kind of gen, genuinely relevant to people who are actually operating in energy markets, which is sometimes y- unique in the academic space. What do you think of the role of the academic is in the energy transition? And I suppose very tangibly, how do you prioritise the papers you want to write? Like, how do you pick the topics? Um, which ones don't you do? It's a, it's a good question. And, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty early on, so I don't think I've landed on a stable uh, uh, solution here. But I think I, I, I do think about the kind of the Venn diagram of what am I interested in? What are other people interested in? And, and where do I think I'll be able to make a, a unique contribution? Mm. Um, and, and so I think that, uh, the fact that I have the, the experience as a consultant and at FERC means that I have a little bit of a commercial and regulatory lens on, on these issues that, uh, is, is probably underrepresented in academia. And, uh, and, and so that is, I think, reflected in the types of papers I, I choose to, to write where I'm trying to, uh, trying to reflect those, those, you know, real world considerations, uh, to the extent that academia is not part of the, part of the real world <laughs> and, uh, and put it in an academic context. So I, I do think that my, uh, uh, my primary audience in a sense is other academics. And, and so I'm publishing in academic journals for the most part. Mm. Uh, but, but what I'm often trying to do is, is take what I read from, uh, from industry sources or what I talk about with with people in industry and uh, and frame the problem in a way that that makes sense in an academic context uh, which which hopefully means that I'm also uh, persuading other academics who are who are uh, who are reading this to, to to think about the problems in those ways and and uh, and bring the the various methodological tools to to bear on on uh, the problems, as I've stated them, which is uh, uh, a different way of contributing uh, than uh, than is uh, maybe the, the the most common in, in ac- academic papers. Mm. So, and if folks haven't uh, followed Jacob on Twitter, he's an extremely active member of uh, hashtag Energy Twitter. So if you if you want to follow <laughs> Jacob, go to at Jacob underscore Maze. Um, but but I am very impressed at the the sort of how seriously you take that sort of public outreach and and debate and engagement. I, I mean, what what role would you say that? I mean, first of all, is is net is energy Twitter a net positive in your life? I, I assume it takes up a lot of time. And second, I, I mean, just more seriously, to, to what extent do you think that sort of debate is helpful in advancing the conversation? Given that so many markets are dealing with some of these you know similar issues about how to design a you know a power system that's clean and reliable, affordable. Um, uh, you know, in a low cost, uh, uh, zero marginal cost renewables world. Well, it's it's something I've gone back and forth in, uh, on, and I, I shudder a bit to be described as extremely active in, in energy Twitter, but I, <laughs> because I try, I do try to to, to manage it. But um, I, I think that the you know it's it's obviously easy to to for it to become a time waster, and uh, and and so you do have to be judicious about how you use energy Twitter or, or Twitter more generally and, and uh, participate. But to me, I think uh, the, the range of, of conversations I have and the range of people I am able to uh, talk with through Twitter um, is a major advantage compared to who I come across with, uh, in my academic and, and kind of conference circles. Uh, so I, I can, you know, hear from project developers and uh, people in finance and people in, uh, that are a- advocates and regulators and uh, just a much broader range of, of people interested in in uh, in the in the energy markets and how they function than I would be able to otherwise. And so that I think that gives a, a different range of lenses on on what the problems are and is is on net very beneficial. Um, I, I I might have to reconsider now that I've been described as extremely active. I have to kind of tone it down a bit, but uh, I should have said um, uh, impactful rather than active. I think. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I'm very impressed. And and even when I'm quite confident on a topic, I'm always nervous of commenting on Twitter just because the risk of getting it wrong and then having a Twitter troll come at you <laughs> seems quite high. Having said that, I've got about three followers, so maybe I should start wor- worrying less about that and just, just try and make a contribution. Well, yeah, I, I've had a few trolls uh and and so I'm somewhat liberal with muting and uh, and just deciding you know if I if I try a few times with someone and it's not anything productive then I I, I think you have to be liberal with just I'll mute them and move on. There's plenty of people to to talk to and that 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 will be more productive conversations. Awesome. And then more generally, and and I always try and get this question in. Who do you read or listen to? And it certainly doesn't have to be in the academic space, but related to energy that you think is always good, thoughtful, thought-provoking and and relevant to your work. Are there a few names that spring to mind? Uh, Yeah, well, yeah, I think I I try to read pretty broadly, both in the academic literature uh, and within academic literature, there's kind of electrical engineers, operations researchers, economists. So uh, occasionally lawyers and sociologists and pe- people that, you know, methodologically are pretty far from me, but, but uh, are writing about these issues. Uh, and then, uh, and then I also try to read, you know, reports from the market monitors and reports from, from other uh, research outfits and uh, uh, people in industry uh, that are, that are writing about this. Um, I guess uh, if, if I, can drop a few names. I would mm. I would say that I often t- talk with uh, Farhad Pilamoria, who I, I I know you know, and uh, I I talked to Francisco Munoz about a lot of these issues. He's in in Chile, um, and uh, and then uh, a lot of my co-authors I I will follow what they're working on and um, and and think about how that uh, uh, how that changes uh, what I what I am. I'm thinking about the markets for sure. No, I completely agree with Fahad. He's excellent. We previously interviewed him on the pod. If any listeners want to go back into the back catalog, we had a long discussion of contract design in the Australian NEM. Uh, Fahad's done some excellent work on that. So I do recommend that podcast. Um, Jacob, I, I skipped a bunch of the, you know, the big names, like, uh, you know, obviously uh, there's, there's a lot of the, the senior generation of economists that, you know Paul Joskow and Frank Wallach and uh, Bill Hogan and uh, Paul Simshauser, who I know uh, you've you've had on on the podcast as well. Uh, so I, I try to read, read read a lot of those folks, but uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the the list is too long, so I don't want to you know leave anyone off. <laughs> <laughs> no, all, all of those names are excellent. And Paul in particular is a, is a very good communicator of complex uh, energy topics and seems to be able to knock out a kind of paper a month while still being the CEO of one of the major grid companies in Australia. I'm not quite sure how he does it. It's, Apparently it's, it's 4 a.m. Uh, starts, but it's impressive. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of unbelievable, but uh, maybe, maybe I'll get there someday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. Jacob, conscious of time, you've been incredibly generous and we've we've covered a lot there in, in I think, uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, no, you're very busy. We're very appreciative. All the best and thank you again for your time. Thanks again for having me. It's been fun. That was Hugo Batten, Managing Director of Aurora in Australia and California, talking to Professor Jacob Mays, Assistant Professor at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.